Hi, my name is Gabriel, and in this lecture, we will be discussing the data preparation phase. As part of our agenda today, we will be discussing an overview of the phase itself. We'll also take a look into the predictive modeling methodology. In the end, we will see how to clean data using the tidy data techniques. Just to provide the context, according to this specific report by Crowdflower back in 2016, three out of five data scientists spend their time mostly in cleaning and organizing data, which makes total sense because data scientists would be getting data from various sources from both structured and unstructured data. Now, before any analysis or modeling, data preparation has to be done. Data preparation is the process of selecting, cleaning, constructing, integrating, and formatting data for analytical purposes. Now, preparing your data set means it has to be manipulated, and data manipulation is often driven by domain knowledge. For example, an operations analyst would know what necessary attributes or features are needed to compute for inventory turns, day supply, and GMROI. In the same way, epidemiologists would know how to model what features are needed to model such spread of disease at a certain time. In this phase, this is where we merge and aggregate database tables. We create new variables or transform existing variables in order to try and improve the model quality. Rules might be applied and at the same time filters may be considered. This is the overview of data preparation phase according to the CRISP DM cycle. We have here each task and the expected deliverable out of these activities. Let's take a look at them one by one. First is selecting the data. It is where we decide which data are we using for analysis. When thinking about the data to be used, we usually think about its relevance into the data mining goals, and at the same time, its quality and technical constraints. Whether our libraries is efficient enough to support huge amount of data, or whether they can support the data types that we have. In this phase, we don't just select the attributes, but at the same time, we also select the number of records or rows in a table. From a documentation perspective, the output of this phase is a list of reasons why we select or exclude such rows and columns in our dataset. The second phase is about cleaning the data. It is to raise the data quality to a, to a level required by the selected analysis techniques. This may involve selection of clean subsets of data, insertion of suitable defaults, or more ambitious techniques such as estimation of missing data by modeling. It is important to know the parameters of the libraries that we will be using so that we can transform and clean the data accordingly to that library. If that specific library, let's say, doesn't support our data structure, then either we use a different library or we transform our data set to fit the library requirements. The output of this activity is a data cleaning report which narrows down the decisions and actions taken to address the data quality problems reported in the initial phases. The third phase is constructing the data, which includes constructive data preparation operations, such as the production of derived attributes or adding new records or transformation of existing attributes. The next phase is we integrate the data. This allows us to explore more dimensions into our current data set. We can combine information from multiple tables or records to create new records or values. 
the output of this phase is the actual merged data. Or later on, we'll call it as the analytical data set. Last phase is about formatting the data. Formatting transformations refer to primarily syntactic modifications made to the data that do not change its meaning. This may include rearranging of columns, renaming some of the nominal figures, and so on. The general output of this phase is again what we call the analytical data set. This is the final data set that we will be using in our modeling phase. This analytical data set may be coming from individual sources, let's say from social media directly, or may come from independent line of business applications like a sales system or a CRM system or a marketing system. This can be built on top of the data warehouse since the data warehouse is the main unifier of all internal sources in an organization. Now let's take a look at the predictive modeling methodology. There are two main phases in predictive modeling. The first one is building the model or the learning phase. During this phase, predictive models are built or trained on historic data with a known outcome. The second phase is the applying phase. Once we have the model built from the learning phase, we can now apply this into new more recent data which has an unknown outcome. To have a concrete example, let's take a look at a simplified churn data set. We have a table at the upper right corner which has the name of the customer, the city where he lives, his or her age, and whether that person churned or not. A churn happens when your current customers discontinue its availment of your services and move to your competitors. Now we split that data set into estimation and validation data sets, which could help us build a robust model. This data set is now used against a classification algorithm to predict the probability of churner based on the explanatory variables included. The output of this model may be a scorecard, which lays down the scores or weights of each value, and then the overall score equates to the churn probability. Now, in applying this model, we have a new data set, which is currently unlabeled whether they will churn or not. We apply the model, we run it through the data set, and then it provides us a score of each of the customers depending on their explanatory variables. In predictive modeling, the data sets have the following structure. There is historical data, which is data in the past compared to the reference date, with dynamic data computed in relation to the reference date. These can be short-term, mid-term, and long-term indicators. There is a latency period that starts after the reference date and is a period where no data is collected. This period is used to represent the time required by the business to collect new data, apply the model, produce the scores, define the campaign, and deploy the call center or mailing house. In some businesses, this may be a few days, and in others, a few months. Then, there is a target period, starting after the reference date and latency period, where the targeted behavior we are predicting is observed. This reference date also helps us to automate the dataset preparation so that it can be quickly updated to the required time frame. As new data comes in, the models that we created before might not be powerful enough to support the new data coming in. 
At the same time, as each day goes by, any derived variables such as a customer's age will be updated relative to the new reference date. For example, the day's difference between the reference date and the date the customer made their first purchase or joined a loyalty scheme is measured compared to a static age. Now the model can be defined multiple times on data in different time frames simply by moving the reference date. Is a good model the one that reproduces exactly the data distribution on the training data? Or the one providing the same level of error both on the training data set and any new data? This question helps us define what we mean by model overfitting, underfitting, and the concept of model robustness, which we will be discussing in the future lectures. Now let's take a look at the core of this lecture, which is about cleaning your data. Hadley Wickham published back in 2014 a paper about cleaning the data, which he calls tidy data. It is a step along the road to clean data where it is easy to model, visualize, and aggregate. This means that this type of dataset is easy for the computers to consume. There are three main characteristics of a tidy data. The variables in separate columns. Each row represents a distinct observation or entity, and each value belongs to an observation and a variable. Let's take a look at this example. Now, what are the three variables in this dataset? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. So, were you able to figure out the three variables? Let's see if you're right. We have these three variables in this dataset. One is the sex, second is the pregnant identifier, and third is the count. So if we will follow the tidy data principle, it should look like this. The pregnant identifier in one column, sex in a separate column, and the count on a separate column. We have each row as a distinct instance. For example, the not pregnant females, the males who are not pregnant, the females who are pregnant, and the males who are pregnant. If you look at this table, it is at its most granular level, which means that we can change the question we are asking before we prepare a data. First, we need to understand the granularity of our data. What is the entity that we need to analyze? An entity is the object targeted by the planned analytical task. It may be a customer, a product, a store, a sales transaction, which are usually identified by a unique identifier. You can have an analytical data set, which consists of one distinct customer per row, or one distinct product per row, or it could be one distinct sale. Basically, this entity defines the granularity of the analysis. Now, how does this relate from our data warehousing modules? One of the key characteristics of fact tables in a data warehouse is its granularity. Therefore, if we need to analyze a specific entity which defines the granularity of our analysis, we can capture it directly from a data warehouse. The reason why our data scientists consume most of their time in preparing and clean cleaning the data is when they capture data outside the structured environment. If I am a sales data scientist and I want to understand how weather correlates to my sales, the sales data is already structured and provided to me from the data warehouse. But I also have to capture the weather data from an external source in which the format I cannot assure. So this weather data, from a data scientist perspective, I have to cleanse it. If it's unstructured, I have to structure it before I can finally merge it into my structured sales data. So again, in case you forget the three characteristics of tidy data, just ask 
what are you actually analyzing? Do you want to analyze it from the customer entity view? Do you want to analyze it from the product view? Do you want to analyze it from a sales view? Once you define the entity, then you can actually transform your data into that specific analytical data set. In his publication, Wickham defined five types of messy data. Three of them we will be discussing in this module. You can also try this out in the Jupyter Notebook provided alongside with this lecture. Now let's take a look at the first mess, which is column headers are values and not variable names. This dataset shows us the number of families per religion per income bracket. In this specific structure, we can see that the income bracket is used as a variable name. Now we have the three variables, the religion, the income bracket, and the frequency or count. We need to unpivot, or in a more technical term, melt this table so that we can bring down the income brackets at the column headers down to a single column. How it looks like, it should be like this. From Wickham's library, which is available in R and R Studio, he called this function as gather, where we combine multiple columns into a single column with a key value pair format, having the previous three column headers as the key and the elements of each column as the value. Does this comply with the tidy data characteristics? Now we have each variable on a separate column, each row is a distinct observation, and each value is assigned to a variable and an observation, then yes, this is its tidy version. Let's take a look at mess number two. Multiple variables are stored in one column. This is similar to our first mess, although on our columns, it consists of two different variables. This dataset describes the number of confirmed tuberculosis patients per country per demographics within a single year. If we look at the columns, we can see here that we have M014, M1524, and at the end we have F014. The two variables here that define the demographics is the sex and the age bracket. So how do we deal with this type of mess? Since the multiple variables are still located at the columns, we can still melt or unpivot this table so that the column headers will, pl will be placed at a single column. Now the single demographic column, we can now separate them into two different columns, one for sex and the other for the age bracket. This is how it should look like on its tidy version. Now let's take a look at the third type of mess. Mess number three is variables are stored in both rows and columns. According to Wickham, this is the most complicated form of mess since variables are located on both axes. So this data set tells us the temperature data, both minimum and maximum, per weather station, which is defined by the ID on a specific year month, and it is spread out on the different columns represented by days. Now, based on the previous data cleaning terminologies, what could be the first step that needs to be done? Now, if you look at it, we have the different days spread out on the columns. We can easily gather it or unpivot it or melt it so that we can have each day on the rows. Now, from here, we can probably combine the year, month, and day to form the dates. Now, the issue here is that one day is still represented by two different rows. From the tidy data principle, it has to be a distinct observation per row. Now, if we look at it, we have two main measures here. The minimum temperature, or T-min, and the maximum temperature, or T-max. Now what we need to do here is the reverse of what we were doing in the previous types of mess. Before, if we have to unpivot to move the values from the column headers into a single column, 
in this case, we need to move the values of the element column and put it as their separate columns. As the reverse of unpivot is pivot, basically we have to pivot that specific column. From Wickham's terminology, we have to spread it. And spreading means to divide the key value rows into their separate columns. The data set on the lower right now complies with the principles of the tile data. Each row is its distinct observation and the variables are located at their separate columns. Just a recap, we discussed in this lecture the overview of the data preparation phase. We also look into the predictive modeling methodology and how it relates to data preparation. And lastly, we look into the elements of tidy data to ensure that we can transform our analytical data sets into something that computers and programming languages can consume easily and further analyze. If you want to explore further the tidy data exercise and see how it works in Python, you can refer to the Jupyter Notebook provided together with this lecture. That's all for now. Have a great day.